Oh. Click. And we're live. It is Monday, December 21st, 2020, 5.02 p.m. The blue go live button on YouTube disfavored us today, and so we are not live promptly at 5, but you know us. Um, we are going to talk Corvids today because it is part of that day, you know, occasional series that we run here on In Lieu of Fun, the Corvids Not COVID series. We're going to run it on our new platform. What's it called, Kate? Oh, Crowcast. Yeah. Sorry. We've dropped the D <laughs> from crowd and we, it is crowd, Crowcast. <laughs> Um, uh, the audio is way better than Crowdcast, but the only thing you're allowed to say is a squawk or what you've been trained to say over long periods of time. Um, and uh, with us um, to talk Corvids, we have the amazing discoverer of Corvid mortuary rituals, which um, <laughs> I, I think is like, like I, you talk about something to put on your tombstone. Uh, <laughs> that just strikes, not, not that you're of an age where you should be thinking of your tombstone, but I am of an age where I think about my tombstone constantly. So I sometimes think about what goes on other people's as well. And discovered crow necrophilia would be an awesome thing to have on my gravestone. Um, uh, so we're going to get to that in a minute. But before we do, Kate has a monologue. Oh, God. Um, I I'm glad you with, reminded me. With a story. Uh, and she's going to tell it to you. So go. The floor is yours, Kate. Okay. So, Kaylee, first of all, thank you so much for being here. We're super excited. Uh, ever since Carl mentioned you, Carl, we like peppered him with all these questions about, like, I think he was kind of like, why am I here to talk about crows? I do all this other stuff. I just have pictures <laughs> of crows. And we asked him all these questions. He's like, you know who you should have is Kaylee Swift. And we were like, yes, of course. Um, and then we looked you up and we were like, this woman is amazing. This and is I'm be totally so hooked on crow or no. I know. Yay! <laughs> yeah. So this is super cool. Um, the story of the Ben, I have a winter solstice story that is a very, it's just, it's just a silly story, but I think it was like eight years ago and I was in law school and taking a break and I just finished my exams and I went to Vermont to visit friends and was kind of staying in this tiny, tiny town in Vermont. And they were like, do you want to go to the, like the winter solstice festival? And I was like, uh, of course I want to go to the winter solstice festival. Um, well, the Winter Solstice Festival ended up just being like a bunch of middle-aged people that had hiked to the top of a skiway and broken into a, uh, a cabin without electricity and lit a bunch of candles and proceeded to drink um, what they called Vermont Russians, which was just straight maple syrup and vodka in mason jars. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty horrible. <laughs> I got and like you couldn't kind of see how much you were drinking or how much was left because it was so dark in this cabin and I got so for snickered and there is this guy and by candlelight he did he was an actor he did this dramatic reading of um, Moby Dick and then everyone except me who was kind of too drunk to like go further <laughs> up this mountain uh, went out of this mountain and howled at the moon um, at midnight and then went down the hill and it had been become so icy in the inter interim that I literally just like drunkenly slid on my butt down this entire <laughs> way. <laughs> I'm like, uh, the next morning really was feeling the Vermont Russians and uh, was there was feeling very sorry for myself and all of the middle aged people that had been at the thing were just like fine went out for a <laughs> and so like, that I like cannot have a winter solstice without remembering um, the folly of the Vermont Russian and the Vermont ski way. Uh, but that has nothing to do with crows. It was just a fun story to start the, the show off with. And we're so happy to have you here, Kaylee. Wait and a you minute, have an awesome hat. Kate, Wait, you have you to put your end hat on. the story. Oh, oh we're with... not allowed to have fun anymore. But in lieu of fun, we have Kaylee Swift to talk to us about oh. Corvids. I'm very excited. 
So um, let's start with how one becomes a Corvid researcher. Um, oh, yeah. Like, what, what is, is it the too late for me? Yeah, what's the career <laughs> trajectory? Like, like, what are the entry-level jobs in, in interacting with crows and observing their behaviors? Okay, this, that's a big question. And the thing that you will discover is, I know this, this live cast isn't super long, so you have to be careful because I will just go on and on and on and on. So we will cut you like, off cut without, you like, yeah, you know what? we're Actually, just gonna, never mind. We have other questions. We're gonna interrupt rudely. <laughs> so um, I, I'm gonna answer that question in two parts. The first is how I um, had the great experience of doing Corvid research, which is that I always loved animal behavior and really liked thinking about questions about why social animals seem to have this more sort of advanced cognition than other kinds of animals. And I also really loved birds. And so when I was in college, I sort of, I started learning about corvids and crows and ravens and the research that was being done on them. And it was just this really nice marriage of all of those things. And I happened to be, uh, very luckily, uh, there was a professor at my undergraduate school. I went to Willamette University. Who Where did knew... you grow up, by the way? Like I grew up in area. Well, it kind of depends on like grow up. So I spent the first half of my childhood in Spokane, Washington, and then the sort of second half of my childhood in Seattle, Washington. So I've always okay, been sort like of a Pacific, Pacific Northwest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I was put in touch with John Marsliff, um, and. I just sort of became a goal in college that I was going to go on to work with him. And he, if any of your um, listeners, watchers know about the facial recognition studies where crows remember people's faces and they wore they like hold Dick Cheney grudges. masks. Yeah, they yeah. hold grudges. So John awesome. Marsliff is a person. Yes, very much so. And John Marsliff is a person who, who did that work. And so um, by having this contact at Willamette that, that put me in touch with him, I was able to eventually go to grad school and study with him. The second part of your question though, I still don't have a fucking answer to because <laughs> spoiler alert, I don't technically do Corvid research anymore. I'm actually starting a new postdoc position where I'm gonna be studying a very distantly related little tiny songbird called the Tinian Monarch. So hmm. it's, it's one of those things that, um, you know, going to graduate school was a really wonderful opportunity for very focused work on crows. But the reality is, is that there's like a very tiny percent of people that can actually go on to lifelong careers doing work with these birds. And, um, you know, some people make that happen through getting faculty jobs where they can sort of devote, um, you know, part or, or all of their lab to looking at Corvid specific questions. Other people might get that opportunity through fish and wildlife positions where maybe they are managing crows or ravens as a part of protecting other species like the folks that do work with ravens and their impacts on desert tortoises. But it's always tricky because I love the young people that come to me and go, I want to learn how to do what you do. Like, how did you make this happen? And I, I'm sort of torn between not wanting to stifle their potential and their excitement, but also the reality of, you know, there's, there's not a ton of work to, um, to find really specific to these birds, the way there is with a lot of like, um, game animals, for example, if you want to do work with deer, who you go for it. You are going to find a job. <laughs> no, explain that to me, though. Like, that doesn't necessarily make sense to me. Like, how much more do we need to know about, like, white-tailed deer? Like, uh, like, is it based on, like, unresearched knowledge, or is it just based on, like, the animals that people have the most desire to track and have more, have very up-to-date knowledge about? that like drives research money? Yeah, I mean, it's a combo of things. Um, certainly animals that more directly impact human interests, and that could be for all kinds of reasons, maybe because we have really consistent conflicts with them or because they're a resource or whatever, are gonna have more, um, more resources dedicated to studying and working with them long-term. And, and this is a very sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I can't think of it. But anyways, it, it's, it strikes a lot of people as weird that there isn't more work to be done with crows because of their, their sort of cultural popularity. But cultural popularity is not enough to get you funding. <laughs> and I can speak personally to this because um, my work that I did on the funeral stuff all through graduate school 
uh, was never funded by a major institution. It was actually all private money, um, aside hmm. from the funding that I got to put me through school personally. So it is unfortunately difficult often to get work to do these kind of niche uh, research projects. But there are lab, there are amazing labs, particularly on the East Coast, and Binghamton, Kevin McGowan, or excuse me, Ann Clark at Binghamton, Kevin McGowan, uh, Andrea Townsend. Like there are people who have made this happen, John Marzoff, of course. And so I don't want to make it seem like it's an impossibility, but it is a difficult career. So I'm confused about that because um, uh, I would think that animals of particularly high problem solving slash intelligence abilities are inherently interesting for study purposes irrespective of their interactions with people. I mean, crows are fascinating partly because we see them every day and people have these, they're not like octopuses. You don't just kind of run across them in, you know, walking down God, the street. God, I wish I ran across or, octopuses I know. more often. <laughs> I mean, you had that great video, which I uh, stole today, of an octopus running, which was, uh, I, I appreciated. But, you know, that's not something you get to see on a day-to-day -day basis. On the other hand, on a day-to-day -day basis, you do get to see corvids being clever and smart, and it's actually common enough that it's mythological. You know, the raven is wise and clever, and the crow is, you know, uh, uh, you know, devious, right? All these things that are, in fact, hmm. we're learning to be true are, 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 you know, part of our mythological histories in most cultures. Um, and I would think that would be the, you know, alternative paths to higher intelligence are themselves, we're very, you know, ape research, which is, of course, not a alternative path, it's the same path, um, is you know, pretty, uh, uh, it's a pretty, it's a big field. Why is like studying Corvid behavior not something that like anybody would, would like would want to fund or, or. Yeah. Especially with facial so, recognition and cognition right now, like that being such an, yeah. So part of the answer to that question, I suspect lies in the fact that um, these are also cosmopolitan birds at least with respect to some of our corvids, meaning they're, they're found around the world. So common ravens are the most widely distributed songbird in the world, um, which means there are really dedicated labs that do exactly that in other parts of the world, right? So there are folks in, in Austria, in Germany, in New Zealand that, um, I don't wanna make it sound, sound like they're, they have the market cornered on sort of this social cognitive work, but they are very well-funded, very well-established labs that are really specifically tackling that. So there are places to do that. It may just not be easy to find that place on the West Coast of the United States, for example. But I don't want to yeah. give anyone the impression that that is like a, you know, a, a thing that's happening few and far between. There are, in fact, very dedicated labs that look specifically at that. Yeah, super interesting. So what, why are you suddenly going and studying this particular, you called it, you said it was a small, tiny wren and it was the monarch was like the last part of it. I forget the first part. Yeah. So monarchs, we don't have monarchs in the United States, but they're, they're a um, family of songbirds and I'm studying it because that would, that I'm, I am excited to, but it was also the only job that I could get uh, in this particular moment. Um, so it was a good opportunity. It's through the University of Washington. It's um, through a different advisor. So I'm going to be working with a quantitative ecologist, Beth Gardner. Um, and so it's, I'm hoping that this is going to be a really good ex um, chance to sort of expand my field skill set, do a different kind of work that will maybe allow me to return to Corvids in the future. You know, I've done a lot of behavioral stuff, but this study is going to be more sort of population and reproductive ecology. So it'll be a good opportunity to really expand my CV, work with um, an unofficial sensitive species, and remain uh, employed and health cared. <laughs> uh, 
All right. Yeah. So let's. <laughs> so, so one important question here is, um, uh, um, will you continue when you are not formally a Corvid researcher? Will you continue using the at Corvid Research Twitter feed and running the Corvid Research blog? 100%. So like right now, although I got some I got some older papers on Corvids that I need to push out. So technically, I'm still actively involved in like research and publication. But I'm not gathering data. And and yet, you know, I just spent like 20 hours writing a blog post on consciousness and crows, because Which it's just what I, I read this afternoon. And I've got to ask you about because oh, okay, I'm so excited. Uh, no, because like, this is like, uh, let's do this as a rapid, uh, uh, rapid fire questions and answers um, uh, as close to yes or no as we can get. I read through that whole okay. thing. <laughs> do crows have consciousness? Oh God, that's a very philosophical question. You can't, well, it's, Ben, you can't like be ask me these big nuanced questions and, and ask me to answer yes or yeah, no. Yeah, let's do a I'm rapid kidding. fire. <laughs> I was being, it was my Chris Wallace imitation. Okay, Chris rapid Wallace. fire. Yes or no? Quick questions, quick answers. What's the meaning of life? <laughs> <laughs> if you were a tree, which tree would you roost in and why? <laughs> <laughs> Um, seriously, uh, how, let me, let me put the question a different way. How would you describe this latest paper's contribution to the question of Crow's consciousness? Okay. As succinctly as possible, the tricky thing with consciousness is that there are many levels and layers, right? So, so. I hesitate to just answer a question about consciousness because what consciousness might mean to one person could be like self-awareness or metacognition where I'm able to sort of think about thinking and uh, go down that rabbit hole. This study looked at a very specific kind of consciousness, which is inherent to our experience as humans, which is subjective consciousness. So the ability to experience something kind of unique, you know, in a way that's unique to one's self. And I think the study pretty convincingly demonstrated that crows can do that. I think that probably lots of animals can do that and we just haven't demonstrated it. I also think that corvids probably, that we will see more compelling evidence as to those other kinds of consciousness like self-awareness down the road if I was a betting person. Um, but this study really compellingly contributed to that one aspect of it, which is the individual experience. Crow higher consciousness. I believe in it. Every time I look in one of their eyes and they look back, I, I feel like they are assessing me and sizing me up. Um, so when I was, a, when I was in college, um, this is gonna be funny. I just really thought you were gonna just pull a crow out of your pocket no. right there. <laughs> so I told you, I first started getting obsessed with crows when I was in college. And this, some of your older uh, watchers may recognize as an iPod when that was still a thing because phones weren't iPods. And I got this on a special deal with Mac where they let you engrave something in the back. And so it's gonna be backwards, but it says- <laughs> not. I believe I, in I believe. intelligence. Yeah. This yeah. was this is the things that my friends and I would all say to me when they engraved. would see me. Yeah. What's that? That's amazing. I said you're the only person in the world who probably got that engraved. On probably, their iPod. but that was that was like my slogan in college. So I'd be like walking across the quad, and my friends would be like, "I believe in crow intelligence," and I'd be like, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, then a crow, right. a crow near a crow. Cool. Wow. Crow funerary ritual. Oh yeah. You are the world's expert on the subject. Um, I kind of want to hear the story about how yeah, you discovered it. Yeah, tell us it. the story. And like, okay. as, as they and, and on this so, one, as they say in Congress, the gentle lady should take as such time as she may require. <laughs> okay, I'm glad we are circling back to this because, like, right away, I need to correct something super important, which is that I did not discover that crows have um, important and unique experiences with respect to to their dead. And um, so humans 
as a species is, have actually been aware of this for a long time. And you can find references, in fact, in um, religious texts like the Quran that reference this behavior in Corvids. So my contribution was not in discovering that they pay attention to their dad. My contribution was in asking, well, why? What are, what are the adaptive reasons for this? Because there's a lot of ways that we could explain why crows, it might behoove them to pay attention to their dad. And, you know, they're not mutually exclusive explanations, but not all of them are testable, right? So, like, the fact that they're super sad about it might be a really compelling and accurate explanation, but it's not one that right now, with the tools that I have, I can test in crows. So alternatively, the very first work I did as a graduate student was to look at whether or not they were using these sort of funerals. And so what I mean by that is when, um, at least in the course of our studies, when they discovered an unfamiliar dead crow, they would alarm call, and then that would result in other crows coming into the area. They would get together in a big, what we call a mob, and they're all alarm calling, and they kind of hang out for a little bit and maybe be silent and then maybe freak out again and back and forth, and then they eventually leave. So when I say a crow funeral, that's the behavior that I am describing. Cool. So my uh, initial studies were looking at, like, why? And is it maybe related to danger learning? And the reason I asked that specific question is that there was some context for that in a previous study that had been done with a relative to the crows called scrub jay. And so we would go out and we would feed crows to get them used to coming to a particular place. Uh, and we would monitor how quickly they would come to the food. And then we would, after uh, uh, three days of doing that, we would introduce our sort of funeral event. So we had masked people um, holding dead crows. We also tested a bunch of other things, but we don't have to talk about that. Where do you get dead crows? Sorry. I, like, just um, like, are they just, I don't know, like grown so... somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> they just grown trees. <laughs> Uh, so the UW has, the University of Washington, where I did my graduate program, has a, an enormous natural history museum. And so as a result, they get donations and they have the permits to get donations of um, dead birds and other wildlife from like rehab centers or from the Got general it. public. So they just have like, you know, a enormous walk-in freezer of just boxes of dead stuff that they haven't processed. And so I'd call them up and I'd be like, I need five more crows. And they'd be like, yep, just go into the freezer. Just look at these boxes. I'm really glad I asked that out. question. That was <laughs> great. <laughs> Turns out to have a great answer. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was very really fun and really lucky You got for them me, from the crow freezer, obviously. I got them from the crow <laughs> freezer. And then crow. one of my techs ended up deciding that he was really into taxidermy. So then he would, he would make them all up for me. Because uh, we didn't use fresh crows because I did this in the summer. And that would be gross. So we used um, <laughs> yeah. actual crow skins, but that had been preserved inside, right? So they weren't actively brought But they're brought so in. good at like detecting faces and recognizing things. Like their their ability to re like, wouldn't they know that they're these were like pre frozen Fo like, I'm faux not to be crow. Real, faux crow. Uh, uh, <laughs> like, yeah. Sorry, so that like, not faux crow, but real crows. But like like maybe they're giving a weird weird call and acting strangely because they're like, hey. Some freak put a frozen crow in the middle of the field. <laughs> like, yeah, no, that's a, well, that's a totally valid <laughs> criticism. And it's not one that we have completely resolved because we didn't do a parallel study where we used fresh crows and, and did it a number of times. However, I will say that in my experiences of watching crows spontaneously die, either from getting attacked by a raptor, hit by a car, and from various people emailing me videos of their own spontaneous experiences, it doesn't okay. look any different. Okay. Um, and in fact, crows are shocking. So I I'll never forget, there was one time I was walking around doing my field work and I had a little rangefinder that came in like a black, you know, nylon case. And I had that case in my hand and the birds absolutely flipped out. The crows absolutely flipped out at me. And I was like, the case? And, you know, and Conrad Lorenz, actually, who's a really famous, <clears throat> was a really famous ethology, ethologist, meaning animal behaviorist, also has an anecdote of carrying swim trunks, black swim trunks and having the, uh, I can't oh. remember if it was carrion crows or rooks or some, some species of corvid really freaking out. So we were pretty confident that this was an accurate salient stimulus. 
Um, but it would be really interesting to do a really robust comparison just to completely vet that. So there's a very, it's a very valid criticism. Um, but so we would introduce them to this funeral thing. And then over the next three days, we would keep feeding them to see if there's any difference in, you know, before they were like, oh my God, give me those peanuts and Cheetos. Like I'm going to come right away. And then the question was after that day, now that everything is back to normal, are they going to be like, oh, okay, everything's fine. Just like it was before. Are they going to be like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't like them. <laughs> Traumatized like, crows. Feels like, well, they they like, some, like, I was like at a Kroger. Weird, and we like associate that woman right. now <laughs> with <laughs> dead crows. Not, come to this Kroger's Not yeah. interested in partying with her. Exactly. Exactly. So, and then the other thing we did is we invited those people that they had seen holding the dead crows back and we would see how they would respond. And in both cases, we found that there was an adjustment in their behavior. So, it's not that they completely avoided the Kroger after the funeral, but they did wait longer to come down and get food. <laughs> and you see what then I did they there absolutely... was a Kroger. Sorry. Uh, yeah. we, I caught that. It's good. <laughs> and then uh, they absolutely recognized the people that they'd seen holding dead crows and, and the other stimuli that we paired them with, and they would dive bomb them and call. And so that was just another um, that helped sort of elucidate another context in which crows will learn human faces. So the lesson to the average listener being, if you ever find a dead crow in your yard, don't let them see you dispose of it because they'll be mad. So wait until it's dark outside. Just like wait until the evening and then whatever you're going to do with it. But just don't let, don't let them see you do it because they will not be happy. And they will not forget. And they will not forget. Uh, and then we did a variety of other studies after that where we looked at um, like tactile interactions between crows and dead crows. Uh, and then we did another study where we looked at um, brain activity, actually. So we tried to figure out what parts of their brain were mediating this responses or these responses. So I, I dabbled in a variety of, of behavioral and neurological tests. What to parts of their brain were mediating their responses? Sorry, if that's a super dorky question, but neuro no. I have a neuroscience background. So like, that's just kind of interesting to me. Like what was, what, like, and what, how did you do it? Like fMRI or what did you do? Yeah. No, so that um, is common in other kinds of animals, but for uh, the uninitiated listener, the problem with an fMRI test um, or approach with a crow is that in an fMRI, typically the subject has to be awake for it to work, right? So they're in the machine, you're showing them something, and then it's like, doom, 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 and it's like imaging what the brain is doing. If we tried to put an awake crow in an fMRI and be like, what do you think of this picture? The crow would just be like, ah, I don't give a fuck about the picture. <laughs> so that doesn't work. Uh, so instead, we had to use this, we use this um, kind of retroactive imaging uh, procedure using FDG PET. So basically, the, the premise here is that we take a, an awake bird and we inject it with a glucose, a modified glucose molecule that has a radioactive tracer attached to it. And this is the same chemical that, that you would get if you were getting a, a tumor PET imaged, for example. And the sort of rub of this idea is that after that crow gets that injection, right, it's going to be there and we have this sort of peak uptake period where uh, whatever part of the brain is working the most, right, is using the most glucose is therefore going to concentrate this chemical. So we have this little window of time where we can show and the also crows. brains run on glucose. That is like their primary molecular food, so to speak. Exactly, so which like, is one... Yes advantage of PET over MRI is PET is a real-time metabolic measurement versus MR fMRI or that kind of thing is is a little what? bit of a um, circuitous approach looking at yeah. blood flow. But anyway, so we have this window of time and they're like thinking, thinking, thinking. We can show them something like a dead crow or a familiar person or an empty room or whatever it is. And the chemical is like sticking somewhere. And then we can anesthetize the bird and put it in a PET scanner. And the PET scanner will go and look for, through this very complicated process, um, it will go and look for where that tracer landed. And then using a subtractive method, we can compare crows across our experimental group that saw the dead crow and a control group. And we can compare their brain activity and we can figure out 
where um, differences in so activity. So it was a super were. amygdala? Like, was it like a kind of an emotional response, like in the amygdala? That's or like, the where question. was it? <laughs> exactly. That was the thing we were really curious about, right? Because when we're out in the field, again, I can't ask crows if they're sad, right? And their behavior is, you know, I, it's hard. I can't interpret a crow's calls and say that it's therefore sad. But I might be able to maybe approach that question if I could say, well, their amygdala is really active. And that's the same for us when we are looking at pictures of our dead loved ones. But that's not what we found. We did not see any significant activity in their amygdala. Instead, we found significant activity in their NCL, which is the avian sort of analog to the um, primate prefrontal cortex, meaning the part of their brain that is responsible for higher order executive processing. And rational, which, rational kind of, yeah. Which as it happens is the same part of the brain that's activated when they see a hawk. And that all sort <laughs> of contributes to this idea to the that- danger dead, theory. Exactly, that at least unfamiliar dead crows, right? Because we weren't showing them a crow that they know, we were showing them an unfamiliar bird activates those centers associated with with danger and sort of thinking like okay oh crap what do i do so um yeah so but that's what, what but our... what is that like so okay they're they get together they have a funeral they study the they notice but crow it doesn't dead seem of... like they have a funeral that like we have she just said like they well, don't have this emotional well, but, response but they right so they don't have the emotional response we, some... we can't we couldn't we can't detect discern that in our studies right. but, but i don't want to give anybody the impression that i'm saying they don't. that we know but we, yes, but we right. can detect that some evidence anyway that it may be a danger signal but i'm a little stumped on what a crow what the action item is Dead crow over here. Hey, everybody, look, danger, dead crow over here. So don't do what? Don't be dead? I mean, like, what, 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 of what evolutionary value is it for a crow to be alarmed and aware that there is danger in general? Just heightened alertness? So, yes, I mean, that's a sort of a good umbrella, but um, in more sort of practical context, if you are a crow living in rural Washington and you have been feasting on some farmer's ag field and that farmer's pretty pissed off about it and it shoots one of you, right? And mm. so all of a sudden you're over here minding your own P's and Q's and you hear a big alarm event and you're like, well, I should go check that out. And you fly over and you see that farmer and it's got that dead crow and it's like, get out of here. You're going to be like, all right, so don't come to this guy for food. <laughs> so right. There is a very salient application for why it would behoove these birds to be able to make associations with particular, you know, in our study, uh, particular places and people that are associated with danger because crow and a, a crow's existence is almost exclusively formed in the context of this. Um, you know, of the Anthropocene, of living in human dominated context. So they need to be incredibly sensitive to our attitudes and our behaviors because it can make a life or death impact to, you know, their day to day experience. So all right. fascinating. So we're going to get to the subject I all know you all want to hear about, which is crow necrophilia, but we're going to save oh. that for the end. Um, we have some uh, uh, great uh, audience questions. Uh, I'm going to start with two that are um, uh, who want me to read them. Uh, but this, uh, 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 Kaylee, just so that you know, is your I, I suspect your first question ever from somebody who has um, been the president of a country. Uh, yeah. This question comes from Tomas Ilvis, who was uh, president of Estonia. Um, and he asks, what is the difference between a crow and a raven? And I know that he s wants me to read it because he says, quoth me after. Uh, <laughs> get it? <laughs> That's very good. I love it. I love it. Okay. Differences between a crow and a raven. So first thing to know is um, there are many different individual species of both of those umbrella bird terms. So um, crows and ravens belong to the genus Corvus. And genus is just one sort of step on the taxonomic ladder above species. So within that genus, there are 45 different species. So here in the United States, we have American crows, we have fish crows, we have Chihuahuan ravens, common ravens, right? And so the difference between the two is always a matter of when you're comparing two specific species. 
Because the reality is if I do finally reach a career stage where I am like primo crow researcher and my job is like to go discover new species and I landed on some island and there was a bird there and I was like, it's, it's a corvid like and I'm coming up with its name. There's no, there's no specific field mark or genetic feature or anything like that that would have me say, I'm going to call it the, you know, palm tree crow versus the palm tree raven. That is totally made up, right? We just kind of pick. It's usually based on size, but like that's totally made up. But within the context of particular species, like American crows and common ravens, there are obviously a whole suite of different cues you can use to tell them apart. So common ravens are about two and a half times the size of a crow. So if you're out, particularly in a more rural oh. or a wildland area away from people, and you see what just strikes you as a gigantic crow, it's probably a raven. Um, hmm. Or the other sort of I like- I always get that mixed up. I thought it was the other way around. Anyways, No, so yep. Ravens are like, they are beaks with birds attached. This they is, just, I you do look this at with, a raven. I do this with downy woodpeckers too. I always like get them mixed up with the oh, ones yeah. that look- But the, the beak size on the raven is also bigger relative to, I mean, their beaks oh, really? are ferocious. Oh, yes. oh ferocious. If you, if you see one up close, you will like be like, you know what? If this bird tries to pick a fight with me, I'm running. I'm just running away. I'm not, cause I will not win. Crows like, you know, you're walking down the sidewalk and there's a crow there and you'd be like, well, I'm not gonna like intentionally get in a fight with this bird, but like, I know if it started but shit, it's like, like only slightly bigger than a pigeon type of thing. Yeah. yeah, basically. So that's number one. Number two is um, looking at the throat is a really good indicator. So ravens have these special sort of elongated throat feathers called hackles, and they can articulate them in all kinds of ways. They can also articulate the feathers above their eyes to make little like horns. It's very cute. Um, versus crows have these very smooth throats. And then the last sort of visual cue that's helpful is when they're in flight, the tail shape is different. So ravens have a tail like this, versus crows have like a square. Awesome. Which end are we this. looking from? And I just I realized how ineffective that is. So imagine the rest of the bird is down here. So the crows have like a round or square shaped tail and ravens have like this diamond. Um, so yeah, so those are the visual things. They, they sound really different. Ravens like, oh, that's my really bad impression. <laughs> crows like, oh. um, ravens are more likely to be away from people. There's lots of exceptions to that though versus crows are pretty much always gonna be in the city or near a human settlement. Um, but if you wanna get more practice distinguishing the two, I play game on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter every Wednesday uh, at my at Corvid research handle called Crow or No. And I post a picture and you have to decide which you think it is. And then at the end of the game, I'll give you the answer and a, a helpful little guide for how you could have made the correct assessment. I find this uh, game one of my favorite things on social media, though I have never responded to it because I have no confidence in my judgment. Well, um, do I do follow Crow or No religiously, and uh, I'm always uh, super proud of myself when I get it right. Um, oh, that warms my heart. And there are lots of people, I just want to encourage people, that's totally fine. You do you if you are too nervous to, to actually come I mean, in. That's I, you cool. know, there's a whole... But very safe space. <laughs> There's a, no, it, actually, Twitter for me, not such a safe space. Well, a lot of people don't like me on Twitter. <laughs> and if I get a crow or no wrong, the Federalist will run an article, you know, wittest supposed expert on blah, and blah, and blah, <laughs> fucked up crow or no, right? Uh, Kate's Titles nodding. redacted. That's, that'll totally, will, that will, totally, that will happen. totally happen to Ben. And I, I am thrilled that that doesn't happen to me. I will be like, <laughs> I'm the one who like, like was on a beach in the middle of the night and like was taking a walk and found like a cormorant and like, took it home with my jacket and took it home with me because it had a broken leg and like ben was like it was like biting the shit out of me and those things are they have like a little like a tooth on like the front of it was unpleasant yeah <laughs> so, i'm glad you didn't get the clap too that's another problem with cormorants wait Talk for another episode. Their wings? no i or mean chlamydia mean, like, clap like chlamydia oh god yeah ben <laughs> i look i'm <laughs> I mean, I'm not the one who brought the cormorant home. I'm, I'm like, how did we just find me out about this? No, I didn't. 
Uh, good thing I washed my jacket right after that. Um, but yeah, no, there's, no, I didn't, yeah. You know, she'd be like, she'd show up and she'd be like, no, it was, I, I was playing with a cormorant. Come on. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Honey, no it was, it me. was this cormorant on a beach. Yeah. It was just like, you couldn't believe me. <laughs> it's like, really? Like, yeah, I'll explain it to my partner. He'd be like, actually, I do believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if, if Kate says it's a cormorant, it's yes, like totally a cormorant. Um, it's, all right. That's the um, question you have to read. Uh, so, wait a minute. My uh, the second question, which was from YouTube, I was going to do a rare thing, um, uh, and read a YouTube question was from uh, a guy That's named fun. John on YouTube who has retracted the question. Uh, John, I was going to read your question. Uh, John is a Seattle-based, uh, I'm going to try to re, uh, reconstruct it. it from memory, but uh, he is describing something that I have seen, too. Uh, he says he's based in Seattle and occasionally... It's not John sees... Marsleth, is it? No, it's somebody <laughs> named John O'Mara. Okay, um, good. And he, has, he says he has seen in a particular park uh, hundreds and hundreds of crows gathered together uh like in giant swarms uh, or flocks um there is a on rockville pike uh just north of washington in in rockville there is a single building uh on the left hand side of the street as you drive north i don't know why that building but every day around just before sunset yeah you know, there's probably a thousand crows on on the surface of the building all on the edges, hanging off, kind of, uh, and on all the wires and all the trees around that building. And his question is, what is, what is, why do they do why? that? What's the <laughs> large group about? So it depends. There are two big reasons. The first can be that they are mobbing something, right, like a predator. So they might have just evicted an eagle or a hawk or maybe some crow was just killed, right? So those could all be explanations for why you would see large gathering of of crows. But if the timing that they're seeing this is is in the early earliest part of the morning or in the evening, dawn and dusk, then probably actually what you are seeing are what we call pre-roost aggregations. It could even be a roost Ooh. itself if it stuck, sticks around all night. So crows are, by and large, there are sort of, you know, population specific geographic differences. But by and large, um, crows uh, mate for life, and they establish a territory once they create that pair bond. And they will, you know, stay on that territory year round. Again, for the most part, there are some migratory populations. But at night, despite the fact that they have these individual territories, at night, they go to these centralized places to all sleep in a big sleepover. And before they go to those not Just so like final chickens. resting places, um, yeah, they uh, form what we call these pre-roost aggregations. We, we don't exactly know what they're for. They are clearly extremely social events. They are very chatty during them. Um, they're maybe eating a little bit, but usually not much. And they're just kind of milling around with one another. So that's, in my experience, the most common explanation when people email me a question like that. Usually I find that it is that they're saying those things at, at dusk and that's the the best answer for their observations. But these roosts can be enormous. Historically, the biggest roost in the United States that we have records for anyway were over 300,000 crows. Um, Whoa. So, or they can be, you know, small little things, but like in Seattle, our roosts average about uh, 1,500 birds in, in each of our two really big roosts that we have in the city. Interesting. Tony Sorry, Kava. 15, I think I said 1,500. I meant 15,000, not 1,500. Yeah, the, the numbers are big. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Tony, Hi. I'm so glad you're here. Tell her I'm about so you. Glad Sorry, I'm so glad I'm here too. I think Carl. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, the Blue Jays. Yeah, actually, I think Genevieve was wondering, this isn't my question, but she was wondering if Jays are as smart as crows it does seem they're faster when we throw peanuts to the crows the jays either because they're the braver or more trusting they're they're all over it where the crowd crows are a little reticent um oh go ahead i'll ask my question uh later go ahead 
Well, it seemed like you were asking if jays are as smart as crows. So to answer that question, uh, we don't we don't know as much about blue jay cognition, but it doesn't seem they, they don't compete as well with crows and ravens in terms of their relative brain size, nor as far as I understand it, the density of neurons in their pallium, which is one of actually the most important cues of advanced cognition. So if I had to wager, I would say no, they're probably not, they probably don't have as sophisticated of cognitive abilities as particularly ravens, but, um, but you know, they're, they're no, they've, they've got things that they are really good at. Okay. Um, cool. Yeah, different yeah. skill set. So uh, the question I had is um, my wife feeds um, anywhere between seven and maybe 13, 15 crows every day. They, and there's seven of them in particular that seem to come every morning. They wait for, they come running when she steps outside with the peanuts and the cat food. Uh, quality dry kibble, by the way, seems to be a good bet. Um, <laughs> and we were wondering if um, those particular seven are maybe part of like a family pod and what that... Uh, what that pod would be made up of in terms of relations. Um, and then I had one more question about them. Um, oh, uh, what can we do to kind of further the trust between the, the crows towards us and their comfort level? And what do you do in the field? Because I assume you're poking and prodding much more than we do. And what do you do to establish yeah, and, and for all of us trust? who want to make sure that when the crows take over, uh -huh. We're on the list of the people who are good for crows so that yes. we can, like, not be pecked to death, um, yes. but will be, like, honored and, like, tolerated. Yes. Yes. What's, the, what's, the, what's the best way to get on the good side of crows in general? Because this is a transactional relationship. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, Thank and if 300,000 crows come to, like, come right. home to roost. <laughs> yeah well how do we make sure that the statues are built in our honor um so to answer the first part of your question it really depends so crows can live in extended family groups they seem to do do it more in places like oklahoma and on the east coast than they do here in the pacific northwest those family groups are usually mostly comprised of sons or other unrelated males Females typically disperse uh, further than their brothers. So, so daughters disperse further than their brothers and females typically disperse further in males. That's generally true in birds. We see the opposite trend in mammals. That's in general. That's just true yeah. in birds, but yeah, okay. Um, so so it, it could be, hmm. it could be a, a family group where you have a central male-female pair, maybe a son from a previous breeding year, maybe some what we call auxiliary unrelated helpers, you know, some other males, um, or it could be a bunch of, um, un, you know, of non-territory holding birds. If this is a real consistent thing though, that's been going on for some time, that's probably not the answer, but in, you know, uh, early and late fall, we do see kind of bands of roving uh, immature birds that just kind of hang out with each other. And then the other option is that they are just individual, you know, pairs, individual territory holders, but that have sort of a truce, so to speak, when it comes to, you know, they can come to your house and they get a resource and the, the fights are, are pretty limited. So any, num any one of those things could explain your situation. And without knowing more, you know, I can't, I can't give you a better, more specific answer than that. As far as how to make friends with crows. So feeding them is the num you know, number one key to their heart. Um, raw unshelled peanuts or pet kibble are the two best foods. Uh, pet kibble is probably better just because of the high rates of peanut allergies in our human populations now. And those crows are going to disseminate those peanuts all over the yards and gutters of your neighbors. Um, be careful not to overdo it, though. So uh, one of the most common questions I get is whether or not crows negatively impact other kinds of songbirds. Lots of people see crows depredating the nests of blue jays or robins, and they get very frustrated, and they feel like these birds are, are really egregious predators. They are predators. They are natural predators in most systems. They may be more conspicuous, and so it seems like a bigger deal to us. But in removal after removal study that scientists have done, uh, they don't seem to be making a disproportionate impact to other bird populations. 
that 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 can shift though pretty quickly if you have somebody in the neighborhood that's putting out pounds of peanuts and attracting far more birds to the area than would normally live in that system. So I always encourage people, if you want to make friends, you know, try and target a single pair, a single family group, limit feedings to either once a day or a couple of times a day in very, very small quantities, like one or two peanuts each time you see them. That's plenty to keep the relationship going, but it won't sort of artificially support a bigger population of crows than would exist in your neighborhood anyway. If you are just starting out, you know, some of us are just unlucky. We live in areas where crows are, are more commonly persecuted, so they have trust issues. Uh, main thing is don't make eye contact. Crows are very sensitive to the direction of our gaze. And so if you're staring at them while they're eating, they're get, that's going to make them really nervous. So tossing food, turning your back is a good way to make them more comfortable. And then it's just, you know, it's like all relationships. Um, trust takes time to build. So just be consistent, keep at it, no sudden movements, not a lot of eye contact. And some of us may just never be lucky enough that we can convince the crows that we are an exception to the rule that they've learned about people in their local area, meaning that we're nice and most people they encounter aren't. Um, but for most urban living birds, there's probably already somebody in your neighborhood that feeds them regularly and they should take to it pretty quickly. April, the floor is yours. Hi. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Smith. Thanks for taking my question. Although I think you've probably already answered it, so I'm going to squeak in a really quick second question. My original question was, since it's not every day one happens upon a crow funeral, would you please share how your field work was conducted? So I think you've addressed that pretty well, but I'd also like to ask you if you uh, recently took part in the Christmas bird count with the Yakima Audubon. I retired. I was going to ask that too. Berlin. Great question. Yeah. So I was on the board of the Audubon group there and they just did their Christmas bird count. So I wondered if you participated. I didn't. I'm embarrassed to say I, so I am one of those birders who gets like really hung up on particular birds but I do not think of myself as a really superior general all around birder. And so I, I need to get better at it and like do more participate in more stuff like that. Um, but it is, it is a weakness of mine that I tend to just get like very niche and then sit out the big, the like more general birding uh, activities. So good question. I should do it next year. And I did actually just do a talk for Yakima Audubon. So um, it was a great community, and yeah, thanks for your when question. I was when I was six, my grandparents, who were ornithologists, gave me a lifetime membership for my birthday to the Audubon Society. And I was like, woohoo! <laughs> it's not like it's not the best gift when you were six, but now I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they knew a future Hi, nerd Richard. when they saw you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Richard, the floor is yours and your dogs. And yes, and my dogs. Um, I don't know why it always happens when I'm on here. The mailman comes and go figure. So, uh, um, so I, I first became aware of studies of bird cognition uh, when I heard an interview with Irene Pepperberg about her work with parrots. And mm -hmm. so, uh, I, you've talked some about the bird uh, about bird cognition already. I'm just wondering about how it varies behind between breed breeds and what kinds of evolutionary adaptations are behind those, if there are some theories about that and what do we know? Yeah, that is a great big question. So I'm, I'm just gonna sort of rephrase your question a little bit, which is crows and ravens or corvids and, and uh, corvids and parrots are both really smart. They um, excel a little bit at different things. Do we understand why that is? No, right? Yes, but no. Um, at the foundation of any question like that, though, it always comes down to natural history, right? Like evolution is not racing for the smartest animal. Being smart is of no value to you unless it increases your survival. And the thing is, is being cognitively advanced doesn't necessarily behoove your survival. There's plenty of other species on this planet that have been around much longer, are much more successful that you know, by that measure, but that go through life in a relatively simple way. 
Um, there are those certain circumstances that do seem to sort of make these cognitive pushes. And again, one of them we think is maybe having to do with being social and there are really social parrots and there are really social uh, corvids. Uh, it can also come down to food resources. So unlike parrots, crows particularly, or I should say specifically, New Caledonian crows are the only animals besides primates and ourselves that make tools. There's no parrot that makes tools. Uh, and the reason for that is not just that it, they're like, look at me, go. It's that there was an um, open food niche because there's no woodpeckers on New Caledonia, which is a small island off the coast of New Zealand. And so there was this food they wanted to exploit and they couldn't reach it. So they had to develop and they a had new to get technique. A little right. Um, Kias, on the other hand, uh, which are kind of parrot native to New Zealand, are often, besides African gray parrots, are often the, the subjects of cognitive research. They can do really incredible, they have really great puzzle solving skills. And because there's no major predators, mammalian predators, at least historically on New Zealand, kias are incredibly neophilic, meaning they really like new things. They, they're not worried about playing with objects. Corvids, on the other hand, incredibly neophobic. So if you gave those two, uh, one of those like puzzle boxes that we give to children, right? Where you have the shapes and there's the cutout shapes and you're like, can you put it together, right? Kias would just be like, da, 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 and we'd look at that and be like, wow, Kias are they so They would smart. break into my freaking car when I lived yeah, in New Zealand. They do that a lot. Go through this with like the Kias. I didn't have a car. Go. I had a bicycle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but did they steal your bicycle? Because those No, they're fuckers. they're not big enough. <laughs> they were like they're there's signs everywhere for the Kias that are like yeah, the same really as like as black bear signs in the US of like they'll open your car, they'll get in. And it was yeah, like, they're no joke. Will, like get in. They're no joke. Yeah. Like they're seriously no, they're like, crazy. But yeah. if you if you gave that same puzzle box to a raven uh, without a lot of advanced training, the raven would be like, get that the fuck out of here. I am not going to touch it because <laughs> they are just really. And so you might be like, well, ravens must be really stupid because they can't solve this project the way that Kias can. But it all just comes down to natural history. Um, and so, you know, level of socialization, food resources, stuff like that, that is, seems to be what informs these differences between species and their cognitive abilities. And the, the list is longer than that. But that's some examples. All right, E.G. Phillips, you get the last question that isn't about Corvid necrophilia. Such limitations you impose on me. <laughs> I know. Um, for the eagle eyed, there is a uh, Easter egg for Kate in the background there. Um, but <laughs> very um, fuzzy. Is it? I see a guitar. I can't. Oh no, uh, I can't. I uh, can't. Like, I can't yeah, yeah. I don't think the resolution. Do, 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 do. There. No, uh, we can't. We can't. Is it uh, a Mandalorian? Okay. Thing? It, no, it's it's a little red horse. Um, oh. Anyway, next time I I will bring it more <gasps> forward into the frame. Um, Anyway, uh, two questions. Um, first, you have a favorite Corvid-related song. And second, given that natural history is always a great source of inspiration, if you were creating a song prompt for writing a song about Corvids, what would it be? Like some phrase that you want to incorporate that you find particularly interesting or poetic or five words uh, that you would want to be in that song? Oh, I really hope you say the iPod in inscription. Yeah, <laughs> like, you can. Like, like that is the song right there. Yeah, I believe in crow iPod. intelligence. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think that's a good one. Um, as far as do I have favorite songs about? Oh, oh, I do. I wish I could remember. So early in the quarantine, this like British choir group did this. They one of them wrote a song about. Um, rooks was it rooks or jackdaw shoot one of the british corvids anyways and how it wished it was more beautiful but then it like found beauty and they did this whole zoom thing where they like did the whole choir song that was like the most beautiful thing i'd ever seen they like it was all these old people like dressed up as corvids and dancing around and like <laughs> singing in their backyards and it was like amazing so that is my favorite song um i oh, will man. try you and... have to put that on twitter you i, I will see this now yeah, cool. I will. And in fact, if there's any downtime, I'll try and put it in the chat. 
Do you I used like to when I was that are yeah when I was a grad crows student and birds like mm-hmm. everything that you literally get like people are like you'd love this and like every Christmas it's just like a pile of shit that's like <laughs> covered in crows. <laughs> so I, I get I used to get a lot of presents from other Corvid files when I was in grad school. My family has sort of tamped down the crow presents mostly because my husband was like, we don't have space on our walls for more crow pictures. So I like, I'm sorry, I love you, but I can't do it anymore. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so it's like just curtailed a little bit. Um, but yeah, if I will go looking for that. And then yes, I think I Believe in Crow Intelligence is a great lyric for a, for a song. Um, it's like an anthem. Yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, it is. That's awesome. All right, last okay. question. Tell yeah, us the story about crows and necrophilia. Okay, so the story is when I was doing my um, original research, right, where we showed them dead crows, they were always with some kind of predator. It was either being held by a person or it was next to a taxidermy hawk. There was some other context there so that the crows would not actually approach the dead crows. When I moved on to one of the last uh, chapters of my dissertation that hasn't been published, which I don't talk about it much, um, we were looking at... Uh, whether or not they paid attention to issues of context. Like, do they pay more attention to dead adult crows than they did dead baby crows? And we suspected that they might because baby crows die all the time because they're young and naive yeah. and, you know, versus adult crows. Ooh, if this is about danger learning, they should pay more attention to adults because that means something really dangerous is it said. And to do those studies, we would just put our taxidermy dead crows out on the sidewalk by themselves. And the first time we ever saw this, we were actually filming a segment for Good Morning America. Gabby Mann, who's the little girl that got all the presents from crows that like made a big splash in like 2015, I think it was. The BBC did an article about it. Uh, The piece was on her, but they were interviewing us because we're also in Seattle and they wanted to interview some researchers. And so I told them what I was doing. They're like, oh yeah, let's see if we can try and get that, you know, some footage of that. That might be interesting for the piece. So Gabby and her mom are there, John Marsliff and I are there, and the cameraman from Good Morning America, who, this was out of his wheelhouse. He clearly did not deal with this kind of project, and he had been kind of like a grump all day, no offense to that man if he's watching, but he was just kind of like, oh my God, this is like so, so different than what I'm used to. We're all standing around, and I put my dead crow out, and it's April. And the first crow comes, and it doesn't doesn't alarm call. So right away, I'm like, "Hmm, that's a little different than what I saw and it flies down to the ground and it's walking up to this dead crow. And like, I'm a little bit worried, but I'm like, no, this will be great because then it's gonna, when it does a finally alarm call, it's gonna be really obvious to the audience. You know, there'll be no question that that's what it's responding to. But it doesn't, it just hops on the crow and just starts to copulate with it, right? It does the sexual posturing and it's going crazy. And, and so somebody standing there goes, is it is it giving the dead crow CPR? <laughs> John and I just look at each other. No, no, nope, nope. that's not what's happening. And John is like, "Go start your field work right now. Go do this right now." <laughs> and so I ended up um, putting out, you know, dead crow bodies uh, hundreds of times, exposing them to hundreds of different pairs across Seattle over the course of between basically like April and August. And what we found was that in the earliest part of the breeding season, um, some level of tactile interactions, whether they're just sort of like, like kind of nervously touching the crows or like literally ripping them to pieces, I probably had them destroy 10, at least 10 of my specimens, um, or most rarely sexual behaviors. Uh, We saw that about 30% of the time, some kind of tactile interaction about 30% of the time, basically up until July, and then it kind of stops, and we don't see it at all during the winter time. And so that suggests to us that it's probably tied to the hormonal changes the birds are undergoing during the breeding season, which maybe makes them perhaps less adept at regulating a complex stimulus, because what we think is happening is they see this dead crow. Is there any idea are... whether they're ju- juvenile crows or if they're like young and don't know how to recognize like a mate or No, I, I know that they're not juveniles because the crows, we always targeted breeding pairs. And okay. I had instances of the pair coming down together and have hmm. two instances across hundreds of trials. So again, very rare, but 
I did have two instances of the pair coming down and basically having a three way with the dead crow. Like the first one would hop on and it would mate with the dead crow and then its mate would hop on and it would get, and it would just be like this big mess. That's so Um, crazy. Is there any kind of biological, like evolutionary, like explanatory device for necrophilia besides besides basically like mistake or practice or something or like overly hormonal or something like that? So I'm, I'm going to pause just a second to also, this is an important moment because when I tell this story, people are like, oh my God, gross. They're so like weird and gross. Oh my God, gross. Oh no. Any, any of the like major animals. social animals that seem to respond strongly to their dead do stuff like this. Like all the primates are like getting horny and like mad at, at dead primates. Dolphins, whew, talk about a horny necrophilic oh my God. animal. They're just yeah, always getting boners. super gross. Yeah, well, like gross, even elephants you know I mean. are like, woo. So this, this actually in the context of extremely intelligent social animals, this isn't like a cor- corvid one-off. This seems to be a, a pattern. Now, that pattern is rare. It doesn't seem to be the majority of the way that they respond, but it does seem to be a thing that we consistently see at small levels across various species. Hmm. As for the explanations, yeah, like confusion, um, displacement behaviors, so sort of like having an experience and taking it out in this kind of irrelevant way, Uh, uh, learning to mother, especially when it comes to uh, in dead infant transport, which is a really common thing in, in primates and some uh, whales and dolphins. Uh, so th- there's a variety of explanations. The problem is, and the reason why our study was so important, is ours was really the first study to try and quantify this, right? Because in all of those yeah. examples I just gave you, they, they're it's anecdotes. They're one-off. Right, right yeah. which doesn't devalue them, but it, it means we can't better contextualize them. We can say that chimpanzees have gotten sexually aroused around a dead chimpanzee, we can't say how consistently that happens. Right. In our study, exactly. we could say it happened 4% of the time in a very specific part of the season, which gives us a lot more um, information to try and make explanations. Everything no, else it's is a wild speculation. Yeah. It's a brilliant contribution. And like, it's a really good guide for like people who want to kind of study this or understand it in the future if they see it and contextualize it of like, when do I see this? If I do see this in exactly. a primate, do I see it during breeding season? Do I see it like, you know, um, it's a really, it's a, it's a really, um, I think it's a very translatable, I hope it's translatable um, contribution to other areas of um, animal, animal behavioralism. Um, and so it's super cool, Kaylee. It's really, really great to meet you. And I hope <laughs> that you would maybe come on again and talk to us. Um, we, this is like I feel like we could do like another hour of like just talking about like crows and taking. Questions. I told you, man, it's just like you get me going. It just doesn't <laughs> stop. Which is the reason why my followers never need to worry, no matter how like you know what other species I move on to in the immediate or long term future. I will always mostly be corvid researcher because that's just what I love. I love spending time talking about these birds, and I really want other people to love spending time talking about these birds and appreciate them culturally in ways that um, at least in Western society, we we haven't always. Thank you for joining us. Uh, This has been uh, super interesting and uh, we're not allowed to say fun because, you know, it's in lieu of fun, fun. but, but fun. Um, (laughs) So quick announcement tomorrow. uh, We have a slight change of plan that not even Kate knows about yet. We are having uh, Jonathan Rausch and uh, Norm, my colleague Norm Eisen, uh, whom some of you uh, may have heard of, um, talking about um, uh, uh, you know, certain projects that they have they are cooking up, and some cool. work that uh, uh, Norm did along with uh, many others on election protection uh, legal work during the uh, uh, last several months. Um, that will be 22 hours and 50 minutes from now. And until then, we don't have fun anymore. But we have jackdaws and ravens and rooks and crows. And we can crows still go to Kroger's. And, and we can go to Kroger's, <laughs> yeah. So we will see you soon. Kaylee, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. I was trying to pull up the... Um, that choir thing and I can find it in my email, but I can't figure out 
It's like embedded, and so I can't figure out how to just, just share. Tweet, just tweet it when you have a sec. Okay, I will yeah. share, but it we'll was about Rooks, it. and it's wonderful, and I will tweet it after the show. <laughs>